The following presentation was recorded at the 2016 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, please visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2016 for helping make these videos possible. And today I'm going to talk about mechanical analog power control computers used on ship floor, or used on battleships and battle cruisers in World War I, as well as the data transmission networks that went along with them. Um, I'm a pure project contributor, which is I'm here specifically and into Linux internal. But I'm also a long-time member of the Dreadnought Project which is an open access naval history project, and you can find that at dreadnoughtproject.org. And our goal is to make the naval side of World War I freely, and freely accessible. Uh, we have a lot of focus on the Royal Navy, because that's actually really the best documented of all the major navies of World War I. I personally focus on the Austro-Hungarian Navy, which is somewhat more difficult to research. Uh, a lot of the Austro-Hungarian Navy's documents have been destroyed, especially in World War II, and apparently some of them were even carted off by the Soviets. And this has affected the German Navy, the Greek Marine, even more so. Uh, researching the German Navy is especially difficult. Um, there's one gentleman that researches the U.S. Navy. Um, the French unfortunately have been somewhat ignored so far. We're looking for someone that would like to work on the French Navy. And there are several other navies involved that we would like researchers to get involved in. So we're looking for authors at the moment. Um, so the basic problem of gunnery fire control is you have a, an, at a naval battle like at Jutland, which was in May 31st of 1916, so just over 100 years ago now. The ranges were, on average, about 14 to 15 nautical miles. And at that range, a ship is just not much larger than a thimble floating on the horizon. And so you have to be able to hit that using nothing but optical sights. Radar had not yet been invented. And you're moving, your target is moving. How do you do that? So, not, not only is your, your target a tiny dot on the horizon, you also have the issue of clouds, weather, um, smoke from your own guns, smoke from your propulsion system, um, any kind of spray, any kind of fog obscuring your sight. And so, it becomes rather difficult to hit your targets in that range. Um, going back to the American Civil War, you had the first fight between two metal warships, the USS Monitor and the CSS Virginia. And they were fought at ranges of 100 yards. And even at that range, there wasn't a whole lot of penetration of armor. The guns were still very short range. Um, they fired, the guns fired black powder with propellers. And it was a whole lot of shooting the target and your cannonball bouncing off. Uh, but since they were at such, such short range, you didn't have the major problems that you had by World War I. I mean, you could basically look over your gun and see your target. And when you do so, you pull the trigger and you're probably going to hit it. Uh, so that's why. The tradition up to that point, and even later, was every gun had a gunner officer that would actually manually aim that individual gun. And while, while most of the ship battles are still fought with broadside salvos, the, you, know, you had an officer standing at the deck commanding fire, and then you have every gun on the broadside firing at once, or as close to at once as humans can do. It was, you still have a main lane. Um, and here's a nice little picture of 
polarized photograph. Um, the monster is a low graph looking thing with the round box on top, and the Virginia is the looks like a barn roof. <coughs> and the monitor has the distinction of being the first turreted warship. Well, they could actually zip around and they didn't have to be, use the entire ship to aim, they could just move the turret and aim with the guns in, individually, and the ship could be sailing on a different course. Now, about 30 years later, you have the Spanish American War, which is the excuse for which was the sinking of the USS Maine. Um, but one of the significant battles was the Battle of Santiago Bay. You know, Guns were still relatively short range. Even, well, let me rephrase. The battle was fought at short range. But the guns themselves are at that point capable of significantly longer ranges. They just did not have the fire control mechanisms in place. Alright, so. So the guns, at, by this point, they invented smokeless powder, which allowed the guns to have a much longer range than the American Civil War. But, at the same time, they had not yet invented effective centralized fire control. So individual guns were still locally aimed, and there were still quite a few misses. Um, and the battle, oh, that's better. And the Battle of Santiago, the U.S. Navy had a mix of 8-inch and 12-inch uh, main guns on their battleships, and they reported a less than 20% hit rate with the 8-inch guns, and the 12-inch guns didn't hit a single thing the entire battle. <laughs> and it was still fought at ranges of just a couple of miles. Much greater than the Civil War, yes, but not the 14 nautical miles of 20 years later. And here we have a picture of one of the ships at Santiago. Uh, I want to point out a couple of things here. You'll notice up at the top of the mast you have your lookout positions. And they'll have binoculars and such like that there. But what, I'm, what I want to observe here is the lack of certain things that I'll point out later. For instance, there are no uh, range finders. And I'll, show, I'll show you all what a range finder is shortly. I'll come to, back to this image. Uh, but each of the guns here was individually aimed and individually fired. Uh, a few years after that, you have the Russo Japanese War. Uh, and that's where the Japanese fleet annihilated the Russian Pacific fleet and then annihilated the Russian Baltic fleet. And by annihilate, I mean they either captured or sunk pretty much the entire fleet. Uh, by this point, the ranges were opening up even more than the previous Spanish-American War. Uh, ranges 70, well, the Russians first opened fire at 7,700 yards. Japanese opened rig fire at about 7,500 yards. Um, the fire of both the Russians and Japanese was pretty decent. We were, had about a 30% hit rate for both sides. However, the Japanese had better guns that could shoot faster, and they had better gunnery practice, and so they, they also had several tactical advantages over the Russians, such as they crossed the Russian's T, which is where when you have two fleets steaming at each other, the fleet that crosses in front of the other fleet can bear and aim with its entire guard side, whereas the fleet that's getting crossed only has the guns at the front of the ship to fire them. So the Japanese ships had, on average, two to three times as many guns to shoot at the Russian ships. And and so the Russians suffered. Um, both sides had rangefinders. This was they had just been introduced a year or so before. The Russians only had a few. The Japanese fleet was almost entirely equipped with them. 
Um, they both had British barn shell, four foot six inch reach finders. And these allowed, these allowed the, the two fleets to actually fairly accurately determine the range of each other. And so that created, that was what helped with the increase in accuracy. So here's a Japanese battleship, and you'll see circled here in yellow these two bar looking things at fore and aft. Um, the fore one is the, for the main battery, the aft one is for the secondary battery. And these are the range finders I mentioned. If we look at this, we don't have them, and here we do. Um, in, at this point, the rectory firing, which is where you have centralized, one person pulls the trigger and then all the guns are fired by that, was coming into use. A couple of the Japanese ships had it, a couple of the Russian ships had it. However, this was the extent of fire control that in the Russia-Japanese war. There was no, there was still a lot of centralized aiming of guns. There was still manual calculating where to aim the guns. And so, the ranges were rel still relatively short of what they would be 10 years later in World War I. Okay, so range rider, they're an optical instrument works on essentially the same principle as a pair of binoculars. Uh, when you focus a pair of binoculars on an object at a certain range, you can actually use the angles of the focusing mechanism in that pair of binoculars to determine the range of that object. Um, an individual observation could be error prone due to all kinds of factors, from vibration of the ship to smoke obscuring your view, um, factors such as that, even fatigue of the rangefinder's operator. However, if you average a bunch of them together, you get a pretty accurate picture of how far away your target is. Uh, the, long, the larger rangefinder is, the more accurate the range is. Because if you have a longer distance between the two lenses of the rangefinder, you get a better stereo, or stereo, stereocopic view of your target. Um, there were two types in use. Uh, the coincidence range finders and you know, coincidence and stereoscopic. Uh, and this is a nice drawing of the uh, range rider. This is a World War I version of the Barnstrong range rider. Um, this is very similar to what was used at the Russian Japanese War and just like a later version. Uh, this was the standard. Rangefinder used by the British Royal Navy during World War One, uh, four foot six inch in length, from one one uh, input piece to the other input piece, and the two circles at the ends are your lenses, and you have a viewfinder in the middle that's you know, that distance so a human operator can see through it. Um, so the bar and shell range finders were what are we known as coincidence range finders. Um, you have a single image, kind of like looking through the telescope, and you have two halves. It's split horizontally, and so what the operator would do would be to align the two halves of that image, and then there was a mechanism within the range finder that, would, once you got those two halves of the image aligned would tell you how far away what you were looking at was. And here, here's what it would look like. And as you can see, the top part of the mast is not quite lined up with the, uh, with the rest of the mast. And this is a, this image is actually straight out of the bar and shroud range manual, uh, the 1910 range rider manual. The, during World War I, the Germans, however, used the stereoscopic range finder. Um, so this is more like looking through a pair of binoculars than through a single telescope. Uh, what the di major difference in operation was that, that with the German range finder, like a pair of binoculars, you would adjust the focus 
And once the image was that you were looking at was in focus, the me internal mechanism would then give you the range of the object. And the German manufacturer was Zeiss, who you know, may have heard of in terms of manufacturing camera lenses and binoculars and such like today. Uh, this was how they got their start, was manufacturing range finding equipment for the German Navy. Um, other users were the Belgians, the Austro-Hungarians, and the Russians used some, but they were mostly used the Barn Shaw. Um, a notable event in 1906 was the launch of HMS Dreadnought. Uh, the main armament was all a single caliber. They were, the main armament was all 12 inch guns. Uh, they, this was one of the first major ships to be built from the start with centralized director firing. Uh, so not only did all the, were all the guns of the same size, did, which allowed, well, let me back up. The, having a single size main arm in it allowed you to observe splashes around your enemy, and that lets you. The problem with the uh, multiple size armaments is that a different size gun needed to be fired at a different angle. So if you're observing, the thing is, is that an eight inch shell doesn't make that much of a difference in splash than a 12 inch shell. So if you're trying to observe splashes and adjust your firing, and they don't look the same, you can't tell which gun they're firing from. So this simplified aiming and simplified correcting your aim. Um, the central director fired all the guns at once electronically. Um, there was also an apparatus where the main gunnery officer had a periscope and he could point that at his target and it indicate, would indicate in all of the turrets the angle that it was pointing at and then the turrets would all point at exactly the same thing. So that was another major innovation that, that was coming out in, around this time. And the last major thing with the Dreadnought was it was the first battleship launch of turbines. So it had a significant speed, or speed advantage over everybody else, pretty much. Um, other nations copied this. Uh, the U.S. Navy started launching Dreadnought rocket ships, for instance. But the biggest two competitors were the Germans and the British. And this led to a naval arms race between the two, and that ultimately culminated in the Battle of Dublin. Um, so, the idea with keeping a range is you have as your you have your raw data from your rangefinders and from spotters, and you try to have an idea of what your target speed is, and you can have you know what their bearing is relative to you by pointing your telescopes at them, and they'll you can read the bearing off from them. Um, at, with observation, you can tell what your target's heading is, which is observed called inclination, and so and of course you know your own speed and your own heading, and so these are your basic inputs to range keeping, which in turn leads to a, your outputs that are used to direct your guns. Uh, range rate is the change in range between you and your target. The speed across is how fast they are moving relative to you. And of course, ultimately, your ultimate calculations are gun deflection, which is where you turn left or right and elevate your shoot, which is how far away you're going to be shooting. Um, you had this your range keeping instruments. Most navies had some form of fire control at the table. Uh, the basic premise is, is that this is a centralized place where gunnery calculations are done. Uh, different nations had different levels of instruments to use on this fire control table. And this is all mostly covering the British as we have the most information on them. Uh, then incorporated things like a plot of some sort, generally. Um, great solvers, which tell you 
different you know derivatives of the input data and keep a virtual picture of the change in uh, your enemy's position relative to you and things of that nature. And they will also include data transmission, both receiving and transmitting. Uh, the British used what they called the Dreyer Fire Control Table, named after, at the time, Commander Dreyer. Um, basically, he designed a system that incorporated several elements, two, uh, including two different plot, two plotting systems, uh, various clock circuiting range, and as well as what was called the Dumeritz, which was a mechanical computer for calculating range. And it was a big, heavy iron table, about the size of maybe two of these banquet tables put together side by side. And they were located in a central location deep in the armored part of the ship. Uh, this was some of your most valuable equipment on your ship, so they wanted them well protected. Uh, and they had data networks coming in and going out. Uh, large bundles of cables. Uh, the average for a British battleship was 28, a 28 cable or 28 wire cable running to each of the turrets, plus uh, another six wire cable coming in from each rangefinder and telephone cables and things of that nature. And in most navies, the location of this fire control table was called the transmitting station. Um, the German and the U.S. Navy all called it the same thing. And it was what in a way, it, it's, this is what evolved into the modern CIC. And there's Commander Dreyer as he was as an admiral. Alright, so this is a Clark Dreyer <laughs> control table. On the right here, we have the range plot. And in the middle is the Dumeresque. And on the left is the bearing plot. And there's also various instruments that go along with this. Um, the major point of this is showing the different officers, well actually, the different operators that worked in this. Um, as you can see, it was somewhat labor intensive. Uh, you had a different person operating each input. And at the time, they did not quite have uh, motors that were strong enough to drive this equipment directly. So they had what they called a follow the pointer system, whereas you had a uh, the receiver from whatever your data source was, and it had a pointer on it. And you had your own mechanical crank that you would turn to put in your input here. And your, the idea was you had a little pointer that you would try to keep lined up with the pointer on the receiver. So even though you had electronic data transmission, the you, going from that electronic transmission to the mechanical input still required a human operator. And they trained literally for hours. They had people that trained just to follow, keep the pointers lined up. And they did a very good job of it. Uh, there's a 3D view of it. And like I said, in the middle here is Dumeresque. Um, and that was basically the core of the Dreher fire control table. Um, it's a mechanical computer, and you take your various inputs, and it points to an output. You'll, you see the grid there. Um, on the right, the uh, range plot. Yeah, and there were variations of this, but the version that was prevalent at Jutland had essentially two pencils. And one was automatically driven by a selectable rangefinder. And you could actually sit there and select which rangefinder you wanted to drive it. And every time a range was taken from that rangefinder, it would the pencil would put plot a point. And so the operator of the plot table there would essentially every time a new range would come on from a rangefinder, you would change that input and 
start following that. It also, the other pencil it would have was a red pencil that took input from the correction spotters. So if they, uh, if they say, observe that the shells are falling, say, 300 yards over your target, they would relay that to the plot operator, and he would input that correction, and this red pencil would then display that. And so your gunnery officer would then take these two ranges and generally and use that to tell the turrets where to aim. And on the left, the bearing plot is a single line plot showing the rain, the bearing in continue, basically a continuous bearing of your enemy. On the top, you have the, what was called the Argo range clock on the top left. And that keeps a virtual model of the enemy's range. So the idea is, and it has a, it's a clockwork mechanism that you can quickly adjust. So if you see that your theoretical range is off, you have an operator that would go in and adjust that. And as, as it's also a clockwork, that operator was also in charge of keeping it wound. It had a red telltale that would pop up whenever the spring was getting unwound. And he would sit there and wind it up real quickly. Um, on the right side of that is the little dot, the smaller dial there indicates your own ship's speed. And of course, down at the bottom, you also have a compass. Well, a compass repeater. Yes, you're in this iron balance of the ship. The compass is not going to work, but it's a repeater of the ship's main compass, so that your fire control officer has a good idea of where north is. And so, range clock. I said um, it's at the standard at the moment, plotted on 46 inch white paper. Uh, and post Jutland, they revised it so that optical incoming rangefinder data was plotted manually. So they found that the single automated, the single um, input was not sufficient, but they didn't quite develop the technology to have all the rangefinders inputting at one time. So they switched to a fully manual input system using a keyboard. Um, the second plot, as I mentioned, was you know, where your, your spotters would put in their corrections. Um, the base input for that was the range clock I mentioned. This uh, range clock up in the, on the top here on the left side. So it drove a, essentially a mechanical spindle that went down to a, uh, you see uh, this little thing on the right side of the range clock with a little dial on it. Um, that contains a gear that would let you put in the, make the manual spotting corrections. And so, and then at that point it drove a pencil on the, and it just works the pencil left to right and the range plot kept driving continuously. It was on an electric drive. Um, wire grid of like, so you also see down here towards the bottom of it, a movable wire grid that you could actually move over whichever point of the range plot was interesting to you. And that would help you quickly line up and visually see where things are going. Uh, one of the later corrections was they made that bigger. Uh, as you can see, that's not very large with the size of the paper. Uh, the bearing plot, which was the plot on the far left side, and it was much smaller. Um, it plotted your bearing, the bearing from you to your enemy versus time. Um, and this allowed the gunnery officer to quickly see where the guns were aiming and it would quickly let them see a change in the bearing. And so he could actually include that in his calculations. To, so that the guns would traverse and keep on target the entire time. Um, despite it, the 16-inch size was actually too large for this, um, 
since you only have a single plot on it, we did need the entire size. The later versions, they were condensed down to 10 inch. Um, it wasn't really well integrated with anything else. Um, later on, it was. Uh, after World War One, it was actually essentially made a part of the main range plot. Um, and they tended to drift off to the side and drift off the paper. Um, and that was a purely, what it was is the gears were slip. And it was just a, a design flaw with it. Um, 1919, they were, like I said, they were done away with um, the Doomeresk is the heart of the whole system. This was the actual computation device. Uh, it was invented by John Doomeresk originally in 1904. Um, and here, here's a top down view. So this bar over the top was fixed. And the grid could be rotated around to and match what your fixed bearing was. Um, as you can see, there's the grid on it. That the x coordinates, if you will, was the elevation, and the y coordinates was the deflection. Previously, I mentioned the your elevation is the angle that you're raising your guns to, and your deflection is your angle um, left or right that you're aiming your guns. And here's a let me see. so. You had this carriage that you would move back and forth on this top bar, and this top bar measured your own shit's speed. And this mechanism, would then, you would give it as inputs the wind speed and direction. You would give it as your enemy's range rate that I mentioned, the rate and change in how far away your enemy is. And you would give them the bearing rate, the rate and change of their bearing. And it would point to the coordinates on the plot there, uh, like I say, giving you the elevation and deflection. Um, it, later versions would also include things like correction for Coriolis. Coriolis, sorry. Um, so you could actually put in because Coriolis effect has an effect on the. Uh, the drift of shells to the left or to the right, depending on your own ship's heading. So if you're heading due east and firing to the north, it's going to be fairly significant. But if you're heading due north and you're firing to the east, it's going to be somewhat less so. Um, and the last, and actually in some ways the most important part, was the range clock. So this is where you kept a virtual model of the range to your target. Um, after Jutland, they were made to be electric because they found that some constantly having to keep them wound was somewhat lacking. Um, they had a variable speed transmission, uh, essentially a disk and ball transmission. And one of the settings was the speed, of the, well, to set the speed of the change in rate, you would move the ball in and out. And there's a little mechan little uh, thumb screw that you would turn to set the change in speed. And it would then keep a, and then your other input was a starting range. And so you could quickly adjust one or the other and keep a good virtual model of the range to your target. Um, and I say this is the most important because this is the device that ultimately evolved into the fire control computers of World War II. Um, the American Forge fire control computer that came after World War I was largely based on this device. And here's a nice exploded view. So at the bottom here we have our clockwork mechanism. And then in the middle is our disc wheel. And to the right we have our inputs to speed, and to the left we have our initial range setting input. And the red telltale here at the top, when that became visible, that meant you had to rewind your clockwork. Uh, and the dial at the top was also adjustable 
to help you if you needed to quickly in battle change the range target, say if you shift targets, or if you decide to figure out that your range is incorrect and you need to quickly change it, you can just move the dial and quickly get a rough change in that range. Um, the spotting corrector gear that I it's the gear to the right that I mentioned that whenever you spot your shell splashes, that would that would you could use that to correct the you use that to quickly correct the output from your range clock to your range plot. And the bearing clock was introduced just before Jutland and was not included in the fire control tables just as of yet. It was included in later versions. But worked on the same basic principle of the range clock in that it kept a virtual model of the bearing to your target. Um, but it was, it was largely a convenience so that they wouldn't have to, so that your governor officer didn't constantly have to be asking the bridge, what is the bearing to our target? Um, since that very rarely changed, unless, at least for significant amounts of time, ships tended to stay on the same course. And so this was a convenience for that. And then, of course, if the, your target changed course or you changed course, that would throw the model that was keeping out the window. But you, at that point, you would determine the new bearing and reset it accordingly. And once again, you have a local reference So the data transmission, and this is the part that most folks seem to get amazed by. We've had analog networks of uh, you know, thick bundles of cables running to various parts of the ship. Um, from the transmitter station, you had cable running to each of the turrets and also to each of the secondary guns. And you also had transmissions coming in from your bridge. You had a transmission from you had essentially a speedometer input, um, and these all worked on the same basic principles. And there were well, there are two different methods. There, what they called step by step, was essentially a stepper motor driven by a rather com complicated commutator like device, essentially a rotary switch, if you will. And then there is direct acting, which is what we now call the synchro. Um, you have two essentially AC looking, AC motor looking devices, and when you rotate one shaft, the shaft on the other end of the circuit rotates the same amount. And the, the second type was called the direct working. Um, the only major user of this type was the KUK Cape the Australian Navy. Um, and the issue with it was that it required more data lines. Um, it, the step-by-step -step system had a problem where if just one cable was severed, or one line was severed, it would continue to mostly work, except that it would then give you an invalid position. And so it would not be obvious that a line had been severed. And so whoever was at the other end of it would keep seeing input and think it was correct. Um, the direct acting method, if you severed a single line in the transmission cable, it would stop working immediately. And so it was then obvious that there was a problem. Um, the direct working system was more prevalent after World War I because the advantages of seeing it quit working immediately became obvious. And by World War II, it was pretty much the standard, especially in the US Navy. Um, so what we have here, as I mentioned, we had rather complicated commutators on the transmission side, and then the receivers were essentially stepper motors. Um, so the Two major manufacturers of this equipment in the world that by the time of World War I was Siemens and Martin Stroud. And both companies made essentially the same equipment. 
Um, in fact, the Royal Navy actually used both, and the German Navy used both. Um, by World War One, the Germans settled on Siemens because that was their domestic manufacturer, and the Royal Navy settled on Barnes Charlie that was theirs. But the principles of operation are the same. And as you can see, it's, this requires, even the step-by-step -step mechanism indicated here, requires quite a few cables. I mean, each position requires its own line. Plus, you need a return ground. Um, and oftentimes, you even transmit power along with them just to, in case local power failed. <coughs> Oh, well, have any questions? Um, this isn't uh, entirely related to what we talked about. You clearly seem to know a lot about uh, World War One, and uh, I was just wondering if you've seen it in World War One movies, and how accurate so would you say this is? So the question is, have I seen any World War I movies, and how accurate are they? Um, I actually haven't seen many, there because there aren't many. Um, the only one I can think of off the top of my head is one about the Battle of well, the Jolly campaign. And I honestly am not sure how accurate it is. Uh, it's a land campaign, and I'm mostly interested in the naval side. My apologies. Um, there aren't any movies that I'm aware of of the naval aspect of World War One. You were talking about the accuracy um, during the Russian-Japanese War. How did the accuracy improve as the machines improved? So the question is, how more accurate whether did these? The question is, how more much improvement in accuracy between World War One, oh, between the Russo-Japanese War and World War One? Um, so, my reference is the Battle of Jutland because it was the significant naval engagement of World War One, uh, and it actually directly demonstrates this. Most of the ships in both sides had this calculating equipment on board, but not all of them. And the ones that did not have it had a valid 20% lower accuracy. So it was, it was a pretty significant increase in accuracy. So you're talking 20 versus 40? Um, basically, yes. Okay. The, uh, the, dry, the dryer potting tables? Yes. How were they manufactured? Were they custom built for each ship? Were they mass produced in some fashion? Uh, so the question is, how were the dryer fire control and tables manufactured and if they were custom? Um, and as far as I know, this applies to every Navy. Um, as I said, they were they all just used some variation of the same equipment. Um, the Royal Navy, each ship had its own custom installation. So like, for instance, um, HMS uh, Queen Mary had basically what I showed you, but um, HMS Lion was missing and it had a few details here. And I believe that they had a different, uh, they did not have the bearing plot, for instance, on HMS Lion. Uh, and so each ship was, even within an individual class, each ship was different in the installation and fitting out. So you as an operator, would have to spend a lot of time to you know that particular installation. And if you went to another vessel, you would have to get to know that other particular installation. Right? Correct. Uh, when did we start uh, stabilizing uh, uh, gun platforms with gyroscopes? And how does that figure into this? Um, so that started around 1917 in the German Navy. The Royal Navy and the U.S. Navy didn't adopt that until after World War One. Um, as far as how it affect how it affected things, we can't really tell because it came after any significant naval naval battles took place. So there's no way to compare it to before. Did that make sense? Um, before 
before mechanical charge stabilization came into play, the firing officers were trained to shoot on the roll of the ship so that they spent a, quite a lot of time practicing shooting at the exact instant that the guns were pointing at exactly the right point. And so obviously you would have some human error, but tra pure road training overcame that to a significant degree. What was the stuff? What was the stuff on the time? Um, at Dutling, um, HMS Dirklinger reported firing a half salvo every 15 seconds. The half salvo being uh, four of the eight uh, main guns. And did these mechanisms derive from the ground artillery, or were the, the the aiming and, and gunnery tables of ground artillery derive? Completely separately from what was happening in the Navy. So, um, land based artillery was largely, aiming land based artillery was largely a solved problem by this point. It's something that had been calculated for hundreds of years. Um, however, the problems of shipboard gunnery added to that so significantly that they had to. You know, derive a, an entirely new methodology. And so, and when you were at short ranges, the American Civil War, you know, hunted yard range, it really wasn't that much of a problem. But when you're at 14 nautical miles, and you have multiple seconds of flight time, and your target is that big on the horizon, you know, it then becomes a significant issue. And so, when you had the ranges opening up, that's when you also had the change in technology. So did this ever take into account of wave size swells? Because, you know, if the side of the boat's lifted up, you're 30 degrees off. Um, well, that's going back to what we were saying on the gyroscopic stabilization yeah. of the guns. Um, that didn't affect the centralized aiming and range keeping any. Um, that was overcome purely by training to fire when the ship was at exactly level. Okay. Um, they had various navies had slightly different methods of doing that, but essentially you wait until the ship the ship is level and you pull the trigger. Yeah, pull. Um, once the uh, would you say uh, once the months uh, and before how did the technology available affect the outcome? So the most significant battle, naval battle in the world was the Battle of Shotland. Uh, and that happened a hundred years ago on May thirty first. Uh, so two week a week and a half ago was the hundredth anniversary of that. Uh, you had approximately 250 ships total, and 25 of them were sunk, including three British battle cruisers and one German battle cruiser. Uh, two of the British battle cruisers were essentially one hit KOs, if you were lying. One of them blew up within the first 30 minutes of the, the fight, and within five minutes of actual firing at the German battle cruisers. Um, if I recall, there was something like 6,000 lives lost. Uh, it, it was a pretty significant event. Um, the British had 150 ships, the Germans had 100. And who won? So the, the Germans and the British both claimed victory. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the British lost more ships. Uh, like I said, they lost three three capital ships to the Germans losing one capital ship, and then there were some smaller ships on both sides that were lost. Um, the British ships did have this problem where if they got hit in the turret, they blew up pretty much right away. Um, the Germans didn't so much have that problem. Um, the German ships were individually built better, uh, so but they also had fewer of them. And at the same time, they're saying all that, even though the Germans lost fewer ships, they also did not sort of out, really go out to fight again after that. So, strategically, the British won. Um, 
because after that, the, the German high seas fleet stayed locked up in harbor. I'm saying this is a big technology, but by a major law, I don't know if she's thinking of the Lusitania. So the Lusitania is sunk by a torpedo and fired by a submarine. And at the time, that was a pretty significant technological achievement, although it was also becoming relatively commonplace. Uh, let me shift from that um, for some reason on uh, the most contained problems of harbor history and what we want to know. kind of explains that most of the uh, ships were kept in the harbors because of the fear of submarines. Uh, that's largely correct. Um, some anti submarine warfare was in its infancy. Um, most, of their, most of the time when submarines were sunk, it was because they were on the surface. Um, I personally, I mean, Later on, when the Germans started unrestricted submarine warfare, the techniques were evolved much more. And so to the point where depth charges were invented, hydrophones to find the submarines were invented and all that. But they didn't quite play a significant role in the major fleet battles. Was that more after World War I at all? Um, well, the later stages of World War I, um, late 1917 through 1918. How much of the facility the World War One drive the innovations in naval technology? Well, um, most of the innovations were in terms of large fleet engagements that you saw during World War One were a lot of the innovations were done prior to World War One. And then again, there was another way immediately after World War One, using the experiences learned to further drive technology. Consider air speed, ballistic coefficient. Um. Yes. The. As um, like that was. During, uh, in 1917, the British invented what they called the wind duress, which is like the main duress, but just a smaller version. And that took as inputs, your wind density took in as an input humidity um, and wind speed direction and that sort of thing. And then you fit that input into the main duress, whereas previously you would just put in the wind speed into the main duress. This problem, this problem has been solved um, about this time, and at the same time, during World War, World War I, the ships were largely kept in harbor because of fear submarines. And by World War II, aircraft carriers had kind of changed the dynamic of naval warfare. So, at what point in naval warfare was this, I guess, the dominant game changing technology? Um, just World War One, and it was really the only, the only, and it was really a significant factor in one battle, because that was the only major fleet engagement of the war. There were a few smaller, almost fleet level engagements, but earlier in the war, um, like for instance, the Battle of the Dogger Bank, um, the Battle of the Coronals was another one. Um, the Battle of the Cardinals was smaller ships versus smaller ships, and that was the predominant story of most of the war. Um, and the smaller ships did not have the centralized control that the larger capital ships did have, just because of resources they weren't fitted with them yet. So it was a it was a dominating factor for about eighteen hours of a several year long war. What's the major naval innovation during World War One that drastically altered the course of the war? In um, the probably the major biggest factor of the naval side of World War One affecting the anything else was the German submarine campaign. 
When we were trying to name Google, we actually went through thousands of names. The name of the company has now become its own verb in the dictionary. Let's Google it. You can Google it. Work the Google on the internet machine. Six simple letters on a plain For white example, page. Being able to do searches in any language about any country. Thing. When you're putting in a question, they'd finish your question for you. We have been working on organizing the world's information. Our goal is to digitize all the books. Today, Google announced Gmail. Email for everyone for free. Google is mapping the entire world to make it more accessible to people everywhere. Google is jumping into the mobile market. Android was built as an open platform for everyone to use and build on. This is Chrome. It's a faster, safer browser for the open web. Google is unveiling what they call the knowledge graph. We needed to understand the world the way you and I do, as objects and relationships between objects. Today, Google's got another useful feature with Google Now. We are providing you with answers before you've even asked for one them. One of my favorite cards is the one that shows traffic data for your commute to and from work. Think about how far Google has evolved from the 10 blue links. We asked ourselves, how can we assist you right when you need it? Okay, Google, call the Walker Art Center. It's not just desktops, phones, and laptops anymore. Okay, Google. It's watches with displays, car consoles with displays. Okay, Google, let's go to the aquarium. How can we help you get things done in as few steps as possible? Okay, Google. Okay, Google. Okay, Google. Show me my photos of Lucas with the pumpkin. But we have to remember, we have a long way to go. This is just the tip of the iceberg. 